It's uh, 12.30, so we'll uh, kick off. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Dean. I'm uh, Director of Human Resources here at the Trust. As you know, uh, Julian would normally do this uh, introductory uh, piece, but he's on uh, holiday this week, and we insisted that being on holiday wasn't allowed to Skype in either. So he's not with us at all today, either in person uh, or in spirit. Uh, but we're here for a report out, which we have uh, regularly, and this is where we get uh, report outs on uh, our improvement work. And in particular, uh, looking at improvement work that we're doing through the Leeds Improvement Method. So this week we're going to be looking at um, a report out from two value streams. So a value stream is a, is a focused piece of work around the patient pathway, it's part of a patient uh, pathway, and a rapid process improvement week is looking at a small part of that pathway, an inch wide, mile deep, and what you'll hear from the team shortly is the work that they've been doing from those rapid <coughs> process improvement weeks and the progress that they've been uh, making. And part of the purpose of uh, today is to, is to listen to that, uh, to uh, celebrate with them some of the successes and to listen to some of the challenges that they've had. So it, it's, it's perfectly fine to, to hoop and hollow and to give them a round of applause at the end of, uh, uh, of all that. So we'll tell you something about those value streams just before we uh, kick them off. But first of all, I've also got um, the, the privilege of, uh, of doing a uh, certification presentation today to Jane, if you'd like to come up, Jane. Uh, so, for those people that are doing the Lean for Leaders, which is a six-module uh, workshop over about a, a year, with uh, plenty of homework and things to do in the meantime, can you join me on, on, on stage here? Uh, and at the end of it, there's a, a certification, and we did one for cohorts one and two uh, a few weeks ago, and Jane wasn't able to make it for that particular one, so, uh, to make sure that we celebrate, Thank you. we have got your certificate you. this way, and I can see that your colleagues, uh, <laughs> Steve and uh, are ready to take a, a photo. There. Yeah, I know that you've got to dash at some point, so you'll be uh, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll get a look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Take the money and run. Uh, there we go. But thank you for coming. Uh, okay, so we'll get into uh, some of the report out sessions now. So we first one is going to do from uh, value stream two, and each of these value streams have an exec sponsor, and uh, Yvette is the exec sponsor of value stream two. So I'll let us say something about the value stream, and then we'll get the team up to talk about the work that they've been doing. So Yvette. Okay. Um, so hello everybody. Um, value stream two. When we were picking um, what 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 should be one of our improvement um, objectives, we we're looking at how could we discharge patients. You know that how many problems we have getting patients out of hospital, and we've done an awful lot of work or focused on the 20% of patients who are difficult to get out of hospital. They need something additional to the where they were before they came into hospital. But actually, 80% of our patients go home pretty smoothly. They go home to where they came from. Um, and if we could improve our process for that 80% of patients, then actually we could gain quite a lot of time. And we could also um, enable some of our elective patients to move more smoothly into a bed. So we um, looked at improving discharge in urology and in particular at patients who were undergoing um, a prostatectomy but for benign conditions so known as a TURP transurethral um, prostatectomy and the value stream so far has consisted of four RPIWs the first RPIW was actually about how do you make the decision when the patient has come back from theatre to stop the irrigation fluid that is going through to irrigate the bladder? Um, and when, how do we know how to take uh, the irrigation fluid down and prepare that patient for the fact that they might be ready to go home? And one of the decisions that the team made at that point was that actually patients can go home still with a catheter in place. They made other um, improvements as well, such as how to keep the bladder scanner in the place where everybody knows where it is, and also to use a booklet which would help the nurses when they were assessing the colour of the urine being passed through the catheter um, and uh, things like that. That team also discovered that actually their patients weren't fully prepared for going home early because we had told the patients in pre-assessment that it might, they might be in hospital for three days or more. So the next RPIW was actually about making sure that the patients 
were <coughs> properly prepared for surgery when they came in and also to make sure that um, the patients didn't have to wait such a long time for surgery that they went through pre-assessment several times and they were able to improve that process very significantly and reduce the number of, uh, well, reduce significantly the number of patients who were re-pre-assessed, but they also set up a brand new lower urinary tract symptoms clinic. And they also reviewed the information given to patients. The next RPIW was actually about a subject that we're going to hear more about from L24 and L25 as well because it was about EDAMs and once we've made the decision for the patient to go home, how do we make sure that we get everything ready for them to go home quickly? And then finally, this RPIW that they're reporting out about now was actually for those patients who've gone home with a catheter in situ, how do we make sure that for their experience um, that they get um, a prompt and reliable good service for having their catheter removed. So that was just a bit of an introduction to the value stream for those of you who um, are not <coughs> so familiar with it. And so now we'll hand over to the team to tell us about their progress. Hello, my name is David Golding, business manager for Urology. Oh. Oh, okay. Keyboard, just underneath. Oh, next one. Next. So uh, the aim of our RPIW was the right intervention at the right time in the most appropriate place performed by the most appropriate team, getting it right first time. Um, so our target, target progress report, following our initial report, uh, initial report 30 days ago, we've seen the top lead time go from 13 days to 25 days. This, this is the time it takes from ward discharge to receiving uh, the TWOC appointment. The increase in lead time is due to referrers accessing the right form and sending it in the right way. We aim uh, by 60 day report out to reduce the lead time with the support of nurse led telephone clinics. Moving on to the coding aspects of the report, we carried out a three day audit of uh, outpatient with procedure clinics. It was a 91 patient audit over three days. 48% of the procedures um, didn't have a procedure documented on the RTO5 and 31% of the forms were not signed by either clinician or nurse or admin staff. We are now going to introduce um, the Paul Sykes Outpatient Weekly uh, Safety Puddle. Um, this will be on a Friday morning with admin and nursing to discuss current issues and our plans going forward. The TWOC referral has been 5S and still stands at a level 3. The front end of the referral, referral which the send, sender sees, appears to be fine. However, the urology CNS team receiving the referral have encountered a number of issues including missing data and patient names absent. Improvements made to the referral system now include an automated response to the sender. Work is still ongoing to refine, refine the form in order to achieve level 4 status. Hello, my name is Nigel, I'm a charge nurse in David Beaver's day unit. Since the last RPIW, we've had 22 TWOCs come through David Beaver's. There's now a new system in progress for booking patients, and all admin staff know the process, thanks to an excellent how-to guide being devised by our receptionist, Laura. It's now displayed throughout the unit. The ward diary is also improved. Instructions are highlighted on the front of the diary on how to refer patients and also there's also a limit of how many patients we can do per day, which is three patients. Patients are then added from the diary to the TWOC admission list via PAS. We also, we also take inpatient, patient, inpatient patients for TWOC, and we've had a 90% success rate of notes coming with the patients prior to that. We didn't always get the notes. The inpatient patients also, was also know the process for booking patients. The patient journey is therefore improved as now when patients turn up at David Beavers, 
the administrative staff aware who was coming. During admission, we now use a TWOC clinic form documenting full details of the procedure, for example, if he was bladder scanned, catheter size, etc. The patient outcome form, RTO5 forms, now completed on complete, completion of the TWOC. The admin staff do inform us if we haven't completed it properly, so we do get it signed and everything's processed efficiently. GPs are informed of the outcome of the TWOC also by Paul Sykes. Hello, my name is Emma Wright, clinical educator with the discharge team and team member of RPIW4. Uh, so as David touched on, we needed to reduce the amount of follow-up patients that were booked into clinic space, which was crucially needed for TWOC patients. Um, and we've created a telephone clinic. Um, the creation period's now been completed and um, patients are currently being listed. And the rollout date for the telephone clinic is planned for the 3rd of August. In terms of education and training on the urology, the new urology internet page and the flow chart, so um, it's clear who needs referring to which service. We did uh, target the high usage areas first and with use of posters, um, actual talking towards staff and uh, demonstrating the process to ward staff on the wards. Um, getting the message across to a wider audience, we've done trust comms, um, social media, um, uh, we've attended matrons and social uh, and sisters meetings and it's been added to the trust discharge training powerpoint we've also got future dates planned for patient care and safety day and acute med patient care and safety day the awareness and usage of the TWOC booklet so the patient information booklet has also increased and that's resulted in patients being more aware of our process and actually what to expect when they come to their TWOC visit work is ongoing to educate and train the urology team with regard to the new coding processes um, and luckily the team are fully engaged and putting forward new ideas on how to continually improve our service. Hello, my name is Crystal, team member of Team RPIW. The barriers of this process is that the old referral process had a sudden end as the system broke, the referrals may have been missed. Communication around clinic times versus expectations has also been a barrier. Getting everybody on board with the changes covering both nursing and medical staff has also been an issue. In terms of key learning points, it would have been useful if it was possible to fade out one system before going live with another. Keeping weekly contact with the away team has also ensured that momentum has been maintained. Engagement of staff, clinical and admin has helped to refer the process. With almost 100 referrals in the past 30 days, we have reason to believe that patients may have been missed in the past and the new process is more likely to capture all patients, highlighting the true picture of service requirements. Thank you. I think what we might do, thank you very much, it's really good to hear the progress that you've made, um, but I think we decided to change the format a little bit so that we take questions as each team uh, presents so that it helps the flow. So, any questions for the team? Ali. of the education I think we highlighted um, actually that there is a community service that does provide TWOCs um, but um, it, it, it was having an impact on the Paul Sykes um, service because the, the wrong patients were being referred um, but obviously the education that we've been done has, has highlighted that, that you know to the trust um, that there is a community service that we can uh, refer to so uh, but uh, the, the cook service are aware that that might this work might have an impact on them as well they might get more referrals and um, so it's where we can work together well I think I, I, it wasn't quite clear to me perhaps you could explain so our so a patient now who's had a TURP because before we started the process, some of the patients would have a TURP and they would 
have their trial without catheter on the ward, and if that was successful, they would go home without a catheter. Have we still got some of those patients? Um, yes, we do. Plus our own T1 apiece come back to us well two to three days later. But now we're putting them on PAS, so we're now getting paid for the procedure. Well, the only thing I would say is that if the GPs were in the room, they'd be saying, we used to send our patients in, and they used to come in and have an operation and have their trial without catheter, and if it, you know, and that, that was all included in the package. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to be charged for what more for what was happening already so um, I suppose I would just query that my, my main thing really is how long are our patients having to wait because if they could have stayed in hospital for an extra day and gone home without their catheter and now they're going home and two weeks later they've still got a catheter in that doesn't sound like from an a, improvement from a beaver's point of view normally our TURPs that go home next day so if say if it was a Tuesday, they'd come back in on a Friday before a team for a twelve. So that's two days being at home and not being in hospital. So that yeah. benefits the patient as well. Yeah. But they're and they're still having their twocks in two days, not in yes. thirteen days. No, but no and no. that's and the inpatient twocks like in part two, part three. Well, they'd come to us within two to three days as well. So that's Probably worth clarifying. There's a couple of different patient groups in all these scenarios. So there's the there's the patients with the high comorbidities who come in and have a TWOC who tend to stay on the ward because it's not safe to discharge them uh, with a catheter in place. So they stay on the ward and they still have their three day stay, which was the average stay, and then get twocked on the ward and leave. There's the healthier patients who come in and have a TWOC with the rapid discharge process and hopefully get discharged within six to twenty three hours, who usually stay in about three nights on average. So they go home. So don't spend the three nights in hospital, which costs us quite a little bit of money. Currently, they come back to David Beavers to have their TWOC. Um, just because of the capacity in Paul Sykes at the moment, they can't fit them into Paul Sykes. So there's a transition period at the moment where we've got these short catheter removals taking place in David Beavers, where we can transition them over to Paul Sykes. So the telephone clinic coming into play is where we create that capacity in Paul Sykes to be able to put these rapid twop removals into Paul Sykes. So that we're hoping for 60 to 90 days for that to take place and then remove all the twops from David Beavers and they all take place which in the more, most appropriate place which was we decided was the urology clinic. So we're in a bit of a transition phase at the moment between two systems okay. which is and that's probably where some of the confusions come in with this process. I can, I can see in the audience one or two people saying Sorry, we'll we just didn't know what Paul's side was. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, one of, so one of the things we've all got to learn is that we, we, we must make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about, mustn't we? Even TWOC. Did, did everybody know what no. TWOC was? It's all right to say no. <laughs> a child without catheter. So we, have, we also have people, uh, members of our colleagues from <coughs> corporate services. So um, good to us, for us to also explain. Okay, so next time, 30 days from now, mm -hmm. do you think you've got your telephone clinic up and running? You said, is that 1st yeah, of August? 3rd of August, yeah. yeah. August, 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 August. the fad roll out, so, yeah. So we've got a waiting list for, uh, for the patients that have been pulled off from clinic already, who we think that don't need to come back to clinic to go to hospital and say we'll be able to hopefully in the future go to the David Beavers patients that we need to bring into the service. So if we can then allocate those patients And much better for those patients, they don't need a visit to the yeah. hospital, they can just, and if you ring them and they say, no, I'm yeah. having a problem, you we can them. bring them in. Yeah. So what we've done is, we've um, done standard work and designed like a flow chart to assist all staff to make sure that we're following the same, asking the same questions and following the same process. Mm -hmm. Penny, yeah. I, I think it's just important to say, Yvette, that the TWOC service, before we did this work, was in a, a bit of a mess, really. I think if we're really honest, we were we were getting referrals not only for urology patients with catheters, but ev any patient with a catheter. Mm. And actually, the right place for them to have that done is with the Cook team in the community. And actually, 
we found was people didn't know that that service existed, that service wasn't particularly busy, as I understand, or could have been busier. And actually, it is really about right patient, right time, and that all our patients in urology that have had a catheter on should come back to the full site centre. Ultimately, they're coming back from them to obviously you know, stay diseases at the moment. But actually, the right place, the right time, with the specialist nurses and the consultants in there to have the right talk at the right time. And I think, and, and, and really kind of selling that service, the cook service as well, that there is another service that exists for kind of more general patients in the community. And I think there's been a lot of learning for everybody in this about what So that's the community in. urinary catheter exactly. service, isn't what it? Could call a rectal urology and a continent service. Well, anybody who, because we record these, if anybody's watching the film, I think it, we, um, it's useful for them. So just say that again. It's, it's the colorectal urology and continent service. Incontinence. Incom yeah, continent. Yeah. So overseas continent. The overseas continent, all right. And the referral forms online. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's, that's, like I say, that highlighted that it's the most appropriate patient to Paul Sykes, whereas before it was it every was patient, patient like Penn yeah. 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 I think yeah. Emma and her team are going to go out and do some trust wide communication with us because with patients with catheters in lots of different areas, neuro, orthopedics, medicine, and, and to try and make sure that everybody knows that process. It is now on the website, the stuff on the website is done this really good. We, we send, send all our we send patients, our patients to, to you. Yeah. Oh, we obviously don't need to. Okay, so I mean, every day for a patient without a catheter, that if they don't need one, is is a better day. Not just from the physical and you know personal feeling, but actually their risk of infection go in, in, is reduced. But okay, Liz. Um, hi, I'm Liz from Pharmacy. Um, it's great work, and I'm just wondering if you have any insight into what the patients are saying to you, because as a patient coming. You don't know things have changed around you. You just accept the process and you come into it. And I just wondered if you're hearing anything different from your patients? Um, what we've done only in terms of the telephone follow-up this year, we've given them that option of either coming back to clinic or having the telephone follow-up. The majority of patients, I can see my colleague nodded in the back because she's involved in the clinic. And the majority of patients have been quite happy with that process. So we haven't really had many patients say, you know, I prefer to come to clinic. So most of them opt for telephone first yeah. and then... Yeah. Right. I think as well the process before the patients were given any discharge information when they were going home with a catheter. So th when they got told they were coming back for a TWOC clinic appointment, they didn't actually know what that meant or what to expect when they got there, how long they need to be there. So we, again, we've done education on the, the TWOC booklet already existed. It was just getting the message out there. So that, and the uptake of that document now is obviously given to patients on uh, discharge from the wards, on admission as well to baby beavers. So they can have a read through so they know exactly what it entails really and what to expect. So it's better uh, information given to the patients as well. Right, well, well done, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it's also um, useful, isn't it, whenever we see uh, uh, people here to recognise that they're doing this as they're doing their day job and changing the way that they... Uh, uh, the way that they work. So I often see uh, Nigel on a Friday about four o'clock when we do the bed meeting for the uh, the weekend to look at the flow that's coming over the weekend. So good to see the work that he's involved in improvement during the um, the day um, that he's working as well. So that was um, Value Stream 2 and that was Rapid Process Improvement Week 4 for them looking at those uh, uh, patients. So as um, Yvette was saying at the beginning, in terms of how we pulled all this together, we do quite a bit of work in the hospital looking at those delayed uh, transfers of care uh, for people that we've got within the hospital because they've got complicated social care packages or they need other support to uh, go home and Value Stream 2 has been looking at those uh, more simple to discharge, discharge patients to see if we can improve that uh, process. So when it came to Value Stream 3 which we're going to be hearing from uh, next we wanted to have a look at what of our in uh, hospital processes so the transfer of patients around within the hospital from one service to another. So Value Stream 3 is about the flow of patients from critical care onto neurosurgery uh, to help us have a look at that process that we've uh, got. And when we set about doing this, what we wanted to see 
uh, was really a smoother transfer uh, of those patients when they're ready to be discharged from uh, critical care. So over a period of time, what we hope that will happen is that the number of patients transferred within, uh, will step down within four hours will, will increase and those that take longer than that would uh, decrease. We also want to see the number of patients that are um, discharged out of hours into a, sorry, moved to a ward out of hours uh, reduce as well. Uh, but also we're conscious that that could create some um, uh, sort of counter-intuitive measures. Uh, so what we don't want to do that is too quickly for people. So we're also going to be looking at readmission rates because we don't want readmission rates to, to go. So we've got a range of measures on the value stream that we're looking at, see if we can uh, shift the dial on those. So when it came to the, within that value stream, the, the particular bit that we're looking at, what we wanted to see was uh, how we could get uh, people more quickly off the base wards in neurosurgery. Uh, so uh, when looking at that, we had an event with staff and people wanted to have a look at the EDAM, the electronic discharge uh, process of uh, patients. So our first rapid process improvement week has been looking at this uh, process of, of EDAMs and you'll see on there that we've got some measures and uh, progress that we're making. And then we report out at the end of that first week when we look at that work, we report out at 30 days and this is now the 60 day report out so we can see are any of those changes becoming embedded uh, in the process. So that's what we're, we're looking at. Um, we'll, we'll watch out for acronyms uh, coming there. Uh, for those of you that thought that a twat was taking without consent, you'll have been, uh, you'll have been uh, surprised, <laughs> David clearly, you'll have been surprised that it was uh, trial without catheter. So if I invite the team to, uh, to come up, to hobble up, um, someone, someone from uh, Virginia Mason came across a couple of weeks ago and this was a team where someone had fallen off the bike and got a shoulder injury, someone had a knee injection and someone on crutches. Uh, but they were all there for the uh, the work. So uh, uh, welcome, and let's hear the uh, uh, the work that you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a it's compensation a claim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, sorry. Sure. Right. Um, so good afternoon. Um, welcome to today's uh, sixty day report out. Uh, my name is Kirsten Leach, and I'm the senior sister on Ward Twenty Four at the LGI, which is female neurosurgery. Uh, and I'm a process owner. Um, so as um, you said, our uh, project is to look at reducing the time a patient waits from hearing that they are ready for discharge to actually receiving their medication. Um, and this is to free up beds earlier to improve the flow of patients from our level three and two beds down to the ward. So, um, my name's Karen Bowes, um, I'm the senior sister on L25 at St James, at the St James, at the LGI, I'm, I'm also a process owner. This is our target report for our progress up to 60 days, it's not all. You're catching me. Um, so um, initially, um, our lead time, which was the time uh, taken from the end of the ward rounds, which was the decision to discharge a patient, to them actually the EDAM being um, released from pharmacy was coming out at 401 minutes per patient. Um, at the end of our um, rapid improvement week, um, we were down to, um, it was down to 125, but that was over for one patient. At our 30 day shout out, we split it down into patients that had been pre-populated. So EDAMs, which was another part of our process, where the EDAMs been started beforehand, where in critical care they're starting to pull the information in, where the CNSs, the specialist nurses for um, the head injuries and the vascular team are starting to pre-populate. Um, we, they've started pulling in the EDAMs beforehand and the ones that weren't pre-populated. We had a, a, a minute time of 316 minutes for the ones that weren't pre-populated per patient, but we were down to 88 minutes per patient for the ones that were pre-populated. This time, we've had none of the, the EDAMs that we looked at last week um, had not been pre-populated. Mm -hmm. So they'd all been pre-populated, and we were at a, a lead time of 128 minutes, which makes us 96% of our target, which is cut down from 401 minutes to 128, although I acknowledge that's over nine patients over a two-day period within the unit. Um, one of the other areas we were looking at was the quality defects, so that um, initially when we first started, it, none of the EDAMs were pre-populated, none of them had any information in, so the doctors were coming at them cold, 
now they're coming at them and they've got information in and they've got pertinent information in. So the, the head injury nurse is putting in whether they're being followed, uh, followed up at the head injury clinic and who's following them up, whether it's a doctor follow-up, whether it's a nurse follow-up. And every single one of them last week had been um, started by somebody, whether it be um, Ward 28, if they were coming in as a dead mission and what they were coming for, whether it was the um, head injury nurse, whether it was the vascular nurse, or whether it was a step-down patient that they'd been started. The quality defects, um, oh sorry, that was that one. The um, medical staff interruptions. We found that when medical staff um, complete the redans at the nurses station, as anybody does, they get interrupted, and they were getting interrupted 100% of the time. We tried to identify an area where they could go away from the nurses station and complete the redans uh, without any interruption. At the 30-day shout out, we nine of the ones were still interrupted and they didn't at the nurses station, but the eight that um, went off to this specific area to actually do the redans. Only one of them were interrupted and they were, they were getting a quicker, quicker time to do them. This time we've been unable to measure that and just because of the bed pressures within the area, my EDAM preparation room has got my corridor patient in um, and so it's not available. But they were, um, so the, the doctors that we were looking at at that point, they're still being interrupted um, because they're not really able to come away from the nurses station. And the set of production time, which was the time from the doctor actually starting the EDAM to being released from pharmacy, initially was set at 28 minutes. Our target time was to get down to nine minutes. This time, um, again, we couldn't, um, we've, we've measured, um, sorry, the last nine of the, of the last week that we measured, um, we got a target reduction time of, um, set of time, sorry, 10 minutes. Um, so one minute off. We're, we're nearly there, we're nearly there. <coughs> Um, this is just an example of our newspaper. It's several. Oh, it's, 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 is it me? Sorry. Yeah. Can't do it's several pages long. So just, I've just given you a snapshot of it. But I've given you a snapshot that we're really proud of our of our pre-population. Um, the CNSs have run with it. They 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 go in and they they ask us. Um, but they will start as soon as the patient as soon as they meet with the patients. They'll start putting information in. Um, there's been some comments from, from some of the medical staff that maybe there's too much information, but I, I don't think we can ever give the GPs too much information. Um, and at least this way they're putting whether they're being followed up by their, them in a specialist outpatient appointment or whether they're being followed up um, in the doctor's appointment. And then these patients are now not getting to, to follow up appointments. Hello, my name's Liz Drew. I'm the pharmacist in neurosurgery and P member. Um, we looked at the process of bypassing the pharmacy when um, discharging patients from EDAMs, electronic discharge advice notes. So we uh, we did have this system available in neurosurgery, but it wasn't well known about and it wasn't widely used. So the aim of bypassing pharmacy is for those patients with the most straightforward EDAMs, maybe just simple analgesia and laxatives, to save the discharge prescription from needing to go to pharmacy for those to be dispensed. It can just be dispensed from a cupboard on the ward by nursing staff who are suitably trained. So this runs across both wards L24 and 25 and as you can see since starting this work stream we have increased the proportion of patients whose EDAM is able to bypass pharmacy from 15% to 29%. Um, this enables the discharge process to be streamlined for the doctors um, because they, they don't have to put all the regular meds on the discharge advice notes, um, only the ones that need to so paracetamol for example, uh, easier for nursing staff, pharmacy is bypassed during this process where appropriate where it's the simplest patient and obviously benefits the patients as well. Um, we have obviously trained doctors involved in this as we've gone along within the project but with a new set of doctors starting with us in August this will be, training on this will be included as part of their induction to our area so we can catch them right from the beginning. Um, and by not supplying regular medicines to patients, we've got both time and cost saving benefits. I have had feedback from pharmacy colleagues who cover the discharge processes on an afternoon that they're seeing many fewer um, discharges from neurosurgery in an afternoon, which is beneficial um, from a turnaround time point of view as well as workload and enabling the most appropriate, relevant pharmacist who knows the patient to process their discharge in the morning perhaps. We also, to enable the bypass pharmacy function to operate, have a pre pack medication cupboard on the ward that the nurses can access. Um, and our pharmacy technician, Sarah O'Neill, has done a lot of work in um, making this cupboard more effective and easier to use for nursing staff. 
We've improved our standards even slightly higher since 30 days by sharing our learning, collaborative working with our colleagues in the neurology work stream who've also looked at this aspect of discharging. Um, and as we continue along the, um, the work stream, we continue to review the contents of the cupboard to make sure actually is there anything else we could put in there that would be useful for, to have nurses using. Um, have we got the right amount of stock in there? Because the more we use it, the more stock we're getting through. So just simple measures like that we continue to assess um, in order to meet the demands of the new process and optimally use the, the function that's available. Yeah, we, um, just on that note, we, we originally took out all the antibiotics out of the cupboard um, because we'd, we'd looked across 25 and, and 24 and it not been used from previously when we'd been using the prepack cupboard. Um, but we found out that patients needing that, so we actually put that back yeah. in over the last, last week, I think yeah. it was, yeah. So we can continue to yeah. um, amend things. Uh, these are just a few pictures. So our prepack cupboard has now been moved into our robot. Um, we've got an instruction of how to. The picture of the nurse's station is a part of this that we haven't discussed today was absolutely no drug charts are to leave the end of a patient's bed. Um, so our previous picture at 30 days that was covered with drug charts now they do not move, they stay at the end of the bed so you can find them when you need them. Um, we started a little whiteboard, which was for ease of use for everybody to see where the EDAM was and which process, which stage it's at. Um, and we did a little checklist um, for the nurse in charge to ask the correct questions at the right time so that we're not chasing that information throughout the day so that the EDAM is done first thing in the morning. So they're just a few pictures. So our um, successes and challenges, just, just a few of them at, at the moment. Um, more use of the EDAM prep room. Medical staff are actually seeking it out now and they're, they're a little bit perturbed at the moment that it's not available for them, but they're actually, because they know that when they get in there, that they can, they can do the EDAM and they're not interrupted and it's less time. Um, so our medical engagement was um, fantastic up to 30 days, but then we left the trust. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've got somebody else in mind who's offered to help out and um, starts in August. So we've just got a bit of a gap in between, but everybody's much more on board than they were to start with. So I think we'll be all right for those 30 days. Um, EDAMs are being completed quicker. They're being started earlier. There are some issues um, when, when the ward's extremely busy and when, when you have unexpected um, patients deteriorating on the ward. But I had a doctor who came to this morning and went, at 20 past nine, I've done two EDAMs, and he was really proud of himself that he'd done two EDAMs. <laughs> and as you see, we have inc increased the percentage of patients whose EDAMs are bypassing pharmacy for a more streamlined discharge where appropriate from 15 to 29%, which we're really pleased with. So thank you for listening, and we'll see you again at I'm 90 Day in Park Out, which is sometime in August. Uh, uh, with us, uh, thank you all for uh, uh, for that some, and some great stats after 60 days. What we're trying to do is, is demonstrate that this just becomes part of normal practice, and that's why we're doing the 30, 60, and then 90 days, keep on going really until that they become embedded. But is there any 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 questions for the team? I just asked about the step downs. Is that doing the step Yeah. So. Um, before we started this process, I think it'd be fair to say that most of our step downs happened after five o'clock, midnight, you know, that kind of time. Um, and bearing in mind the level of, you know, some of our patients have tracheostomies and things like that, so it's a safe time to be doing it. So our e downs now have been getting done at nine, ten o'clock in the morning, not four, five o'clock. So those patients are leaving, the beds turn around much quicker, and that step down is definitely improving. It's not where we want it to be yet. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just, but it, it is improving. Mm -hmm. I had a patient on Tuesday who said, um, I'm, I can go home, I'm just waiting for me, me, me letter to the doctor. And I've been told it's going to be the middle of the afternoon, everybody's telling me at home. And I was like, No, actually, you'll, you'll be ready by 11. Mm -hmm. And he was. Helen? Yeah. Um, oh, I think it's done great. Well done. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. It's really hard, isn't it? So I was just thinking about some of the structural things that we have in place that. St. David's that I don't think are in, in place at Jimmy's at um, LGI uh, and just wondering about those. So we have a, a, a discharge lounge here and, and lots of places um, have emails rolled out. So I just didn't know whether the timescales for um, 
seen then in, in, in your CSU and the discharge lounge, obviously that's a bigger decision than you guys at the LGI. But if I you think the discharge lounge was discussed and decided that we weren't going to do it because it's just putting a patient somewhere else to wait. Mm -hmm. Rather than making the patient wait, we wanted to tackle it and get them out yeah, straight away. Right. So I think we, I think that's right, Sarah, that we weren't yeah, at that I point. Yeah, from a progress perspective, we didn't feel that adding that extra step would be helpful. I know when the CSU came <coughs> together for the AGI science meeting, mm -hmm. we had discussed um, the potential of a discharge lounge. Um, but it's not completely ruled out, it's just where it could be. And, and I, I just think from, for, from a lot of the patients from neurosurgery that are spinal operations have had neurosurgery, they can't go sit in a chair waiting, they, they've got to have the, the option to lay down. So it's standing and walking mm. or laying down, but they can sit for a short period, but sitting for a prolonged period um, mm. is something they can't do. So there's, there's some of those that have got some issues. And I think we're due for rollout for the e e is it next, beginning of next year. Towards the end of this year. year. It, it's so moving slightly, but I think end of the year. Kind of good practice and drop it yeah. Yeah. Well, it should make it Something even quicker easy. because yeah. it's, yeah. yeah, so we're hoping that it'll get better by the so end of the year. So what are you using at the moment, please? Is it blue sphere? Blue yeah. Blue sphere, yeah. Yeah. I just want to ask, how do you prioritise uh, the need on CAT medics? So do you do that the night before? Just because we've done so early, you know, it's no, we have, we have, it's very, it's very, um, neurosurgery is, is I, I don't know whether, I don't know what it's like in other areas, on the morning on neurosurgery, between eight o'clock and about quarter to nine, I have three ward rounds that do every single patient on the ward, um, and by the end of that, I will, between that and, and 9.30ish, I will know the patients from that day that's been discharged, and then, um, as I'm going round with the doctors in the checklist, um, I'll just say, fudge, I need any down. I need another read down, uh, and, and that's then. But he's he's he marks that down as well. But, but we then are, we put it on. Oh, sorry, we are trying to start it so that we can preempt, you know, our simple um, lumbar spines. A couple of days, we need to preempt that. We need Absolutely. to get it done the day before. Absolutely. We're not quite there, but we are in the process of. Having said having that. said that, out of those figures, two of them were a zero um, a day because they were already prepared the day before. But that depends on you know how many medics you've got and how busy the ward is, and that's not something that's always easily to easy to figure out. Can I just check with you, sir? I guess sort of informal feedback. So, 24 is the female ward, yeah. 25 is the, the male ward. We've talked about 24 and 25. Do you, do you think it's equally embedded, or is any area doing different to others? Is there anything at play there? I think it's I think it's equally embedded. I think. Maybe the the um, checklist is slightly more embedded in 25 than it is in 24, but I think the board is slightly more. It, so I think across the truck the way, but, but we're very we're next door to each other and, and the staff are very interchangeable and they work very well together. So I just wanted to check with uh, with Liz as well. I, I don't know if you have to call Liz to working pharmacy or something. You probably should be meeting about pharmacy with that someone called Liz being being with you. But the the I think that was really impressive stuff, wasn't it? From 15 to 29 percent in terms of like, bypassing. Yeah, I mean, is your sense that outside of this area there is a significant gain for us to be made there as well with the, the bypassing and pharmacy? Well, the bypassing pharmacy function operates in a number of other areas already. For example, ENT and urology and some areas of surgery already use it. Um, it tends to only work well for those patients whose discharge prescriptions are quite simple. Yeah. So um, I think in a lot of medical areas it might be quite difficult. But certainly we've collaborated with the urology work stream to share our learning and because there's people who work in that group work wider across surgery here at, at St James's, that's something we'll certainly look at to see if we think it could be of benefit. We need to be mindful of the fact that if we are not putting a patient to regular medicines on their discharge prescription, there could be some consequences of that in terms of clarity of information for the GP. So we can't just run with it and you know yeah. apply it to everybody. But certainly for some patients, it's very useful. Any other questions? Can I just ask if, if the consultants are contributing to pre-populating the EDAM at all? So, so we discussed it, um, <laughs> and um, they use a different system to write their op notes, and that system doesn't link yet 
to the blue sphere that we're using. Yeah. So they are happy to do it, they're just not going to do it twice. No, and, and I so think when you go to EMEDS and, and the yes. systems link yeah. to PPM, yeah. that will be... Yeah. yeah. But the information is there, it could link easy, but that's an IT issue and that's like a what we call a parking lot, something that's too big for our 90 days. But we did come up with, yeah, so they are on board. Thanks very much. We've got, um, so that was at the six day report out, as you said, we'll be back for the 90 day report out. We, we have a meeting as a sponsor team, uh, actually after this, uh, this meeting today, and we'll be looking at our next rapid process improvement week for this value stream. I think that's likely to be in October, and uh, it's likely to be looking at uh, tracky, uh, patients with a tracheotomy and about how we transfer those uh, patients as the next part of looking at that uh, uh, pathway. So we'll be uh, following through with those um, inch wide mile deeps all along uh, the part of that uh, process. But uh, should we just uh, thank you again uh, for doing this? <laughs>